next speaker. Susanna Jessup is the Director of Research and Engagement at the Asia New Zealand Foundation. She leads the Foundation's research work, including its annual survey, New Zealanders' Perception of Asia and Asian Peoples, and its Track 2 uh, informal diplomacy program with partner organisations across Asia. As Deputy High Commissioner to India, she became well known for her very beautiful saris, and I see that she has taken the opportunity uh, to wear one today. And she also graced uh, the, De the Delhi socialite pages um, in said saris. Um, so we're very pleased to have her here today. Um, she'll be talking to us about um, how and where India sits in the Kiwi psyche and why India is New Zealand for um, sorry, why India is important for New Zealand's future, um, as well as the importance of soft diplomacy. Thanks, Suze. Good morning. If you walked out of this conference today and asked someone on the street how much they felt they might know about Asia, 52% will tell you they know little to nothing. Roughly half of New Zealand's adult population. In 2013, just six years ago, that figure would have been 67%, two thirds of our adult population. This is quite a, a stunning statistic for a region that's not only gonna be shaping New Zealand's future, but changing global order. But why, sitting here at the INZBC conference, reflecting on trade opportunities in India, should we worry about New Zealand's self-assessed knowledge of Asia? Well, there's three reasons. Firstly, research conducted by the Asia New Zealand Foundation, where I work as the Director of Research and Track 2 Diplomacy, shows that knowledge helps us build confidence. And with that confidence comes a feeling of empowerment. When you feel empowered, you often feel more positive, and because you can distinguish the good from the bad, you can make more informed choices. With knowledge, suddenly a market like India can feel more accessible and achievable. Secondly, our research shows that those with the fastest growing knowledge of Asia are under 30. This is the generation who are learning Korean through gaming and K-pop, not a four year degree. These are your future workers and these are your future consumers. Thirdly, it pays to remember that if half of New Zealand's adult population doesn't know Asia, then the chances are Asia doesn't know us. So you can't assume going into any market that you're known and understood. And this is particularly true for India. If you ask that same person on the street which part of Asia they know best, roughly 40% will say they know North Asia, followed by 30% for Southeast Asia, and only 20% or one-fifth of our adult population for Southeast Asia. Why do we know North Asia so well and South Asia not so well? Firstly, we know trade builds connections, and through those connections, we grow closer and more familiar with each other. This connection, as Farad noted, demands access, delivered through immigration and air services, and builds social connections, which foster languages and other cultural competencies. Japan, the country we know best in North Asia, has been very successful in New Zealand because of these factors and because it has invested in highly successful social connectivity programs like the JET program, which sent a whole lot of Kiwis off to, to Japan to teach English, and they in turn became um, great advocates of the New Zealand-Japan relationship because of the fondness they developed for their host country. Japan has also been extremely successful with its soft diplomacy, Think sushi, Mari Kondo, um, architecture, ceramics, indigo, pop music, fashion, architecture, high tech consumer gadgets. And this is no accident. When Prime Minister Abe was elected in 2012, he asserted Japan is back and he named soft diplomacy or soft power as one of the key mechanisms through which policymakers would deliver. Since then, Tokyo has been successfully converting the global spread of Japanese pop culture into political influence and economic gain. But let's shine a light on ourselves for a moment. If you're sitting out in Asia, what do you know of New Zealand? What is our story? What are the things that a 25-year-old woman in Kerala might think about us or a Mumbai businessman? 
I heard a speech the other day from a young grad that the foundation had sent to China. And she was working with her colleagues and she said after some time, oh, I come from New Zealand, and she sort of laughed and said, you know, she expected to sort of stand back and then people would say, oh, clean and green, beautiful country, very sporty, very cool. And instead they said, oh, milk powder. And this is the flip side of a story that's all about trade. Your products can start to define you and that can be very limiting. For any business, like any country, we want to build a reputation that outlasts a single product. Soft skills can provide this buffer. They are the skills that glue you to a market when an economy waxes and wanes. We've seen Japan do it in weekend too. Now, I'm gonna break into some slides here. How will I break into slides? There we go. In the absence of a big trade relationship, the other way knowledge can be built, or rather perceptions shaped, is through media. And for India, this is particularly true. We're all familiar with the headlines that a country of India's size and diversity can generate for media outlets. Like Sharks for Australia, India gets its fair share of negative shock press. It's the stuff that sells papers, but like milk powder for New Zealand, certainly shouldn't define it. The good news is things are changing. In the past, when we surveyed New Zealanders, 70% would be able to recall Asia-related stories, but their overriding impression was that those stories were negative. Today, fewer people can recall Asia-related media coverage, so it's around 40%, but their overriding perception is positive. The primary reason for this shift is that we're moving away from single-source domestically produced news, so that's like a, a TV, radio, um, into multiple sources and from a range of outlets and from a range of people and countries. The broadening range of information and sources and the types of coverage available, particularly through social media, is changing the, our perceptions and attitudes towards, towards Asia. We are now way more connected. You can expect consumers anywhere to have knowledge of companies' corporate social responsibility and their sustainability policies as much as you can about India's famous foods, spice markets, yoga, and so on. And as we've seen over the last few years, the potential for so-called fake news to impact relationships and brands. And getting ahead of this curve is critical to modern business practice, but it's particularly critical in a country like India, which has such high digital penetration rates. But where am I going with all this, you may well ask, and with three minutes left. Well, for the last few years, I've been living in India, and over that time, I saw firsthand, time and again, how a lack of knowledge, unconscious bias, and underplayed soft diplomacy skills impacted business. How seemingly bright ideas in New Zealand completely missed the mark in India, and how visiting Kiwis would say one thing, and our Indian hosts would hear another. We know that trade isn't all about selling stuff. It's about building knowledge, building familiarity and confidence, and building positive impressions and connections. It's as much about building reputation and brand as it is about selling. The story that Kiwi businesses might try to sell offshore is often limited to a, a sort of trade story. We're innovative, we're high tech, number eight wire solutions and so on. But this is not always the stuff that wins hearts and minds. It's not always the stuff that fits a local market context. And does it really define you from another country or another country for that matter? What I would like to hear more of is what are your values? What gives you mana? What do you respect? What knowledge do you have of what Indians respect? What knowledge do you have of the states you're going into and the things that, that they value in those states? What is your story? These are your soft skills. Our research shows that Māori have an edge when it comes to engaging in Asia for the very reason of their soft skills, because many of the things Māori value, their Asian counterparts do too. So respect for elders, the importance of food, the role of gifting, and so on. These seemingly small connections offer larger experiences that help build confidence to engage and connect. They are the things that help build a meaningful brand. And as Esther alluded to, I, I, in my own small way, I had a sense of this in India when I started to wear saris. I had no sense of how wearing a sari would rebrand me and how it would open doors and how it would change the way I was treated in India. 
I wore them for roughly two years. And when I met Minister, the late Minister Sushma Swaraj, we, we chatted mostly, and probably I would be fired from the foreign ministry at the time, because we'd used most of the time chatting about my Banasi sari, and we cleared a few minutes, uh, in the last few minutes, a few items of work. But I'm quite sure Minister Swaraj remembered my name, not because of my trade law expertise, but because of my Banasi sari. Prime Minister Modi knows the power of branding. When he was elected in 2014, he embarked on a huge rebranding campaign to change the way India saw themselves and behaved. Brands like Incredible India, Make in India and Swash Bharat were designed to recast India in a new light and encourage people to act like the country Modi put forward to the world. India reimagined itself and I think we need to reimagine India too. It's not going to be a free trade story. India is going to remain a market fixated on its own economic and development needs. If you're going to trade with India, the benefit to India has to be crystal clear. And that benefit's not necessarily about the quality of the product that you're offering, but it's about value. It's about job creation, investment, using your know-how to help India connect and grow, and in turn, finding a way to extract benefit yourself. And as most people would tell you, it's also about volume. So for a country like New Zealand, scalability often is quite a challenge, moving from our small market to one of India's size. But trust me, that is a challenge that the New Zealand government faces, let alone each company. So that's something that we are working through together. But in all the heady talk of numbers, don't forget the power of soft diplomacy to open doors and build relationships. New Zealand's $28 billion relationship with China didn't start with milk powder. It kicked off with a Chinese classical theatre troupe in 1956. So what's your India moment going to be? Sure, it might be facilitated by RCEP, but that's going to be a moment shared with others and will take time to grow. Meanwhile, I'd put my money on building knowledge, genuine knowledge, investing time in really getting to know Indian market and people, using soft skills to build your brand, and building confidence and partnerships that will work. This is something the Asia Foundation has been working on too, through visits of young entrepreneurs and leaders, through initiatives such as artist residencies, schools and teacher programs, through business internships, and um, what I lead through informal track two dialogues. We have sent over 450 New Zealand journalists into Asia to help change the narrative of what, how countries like India are represented in New Zealand. And over the coming months, we'll release, release two major publications on India. But ultimately, we're all in the business of telling New Zealand's, uh, India and New Zealand's story. So I really look forward to hearing your stories and um, I look forward to connecting because um, we are, we're all in the same business. This is our, this is our brand. Please look us up um, and chat over lunch. Thank you very much.